In today's lecture, we're going to look at water and health. We're going to look at three case studies that help us understand the historical context of how we first learned about the importance of water as it relates to health. One of those in the mid-1800s in London. A second, we'll look at Chicago in the late 1800s. And then we'll fast forward to 1993 in Milwaukee. And in each of these case studies, we'll see how the connection between water and health first became apparent and how it's even very much still an issue in more recent times. We'll start in London. In the uh, mid-1800s, we didn't yet understand why a disease was transmitted from one person to another, from one location to another. It was an outbreak of cholera in London that really helped to highlight these issues. At this time, it was thought that poison somehow transferred around through the atmosphere or through the soil or somehow, uh, but it didn't quite fit with the, the transfer of the disease, and so it was in 1854 uh, that John Snow, a, a medical doctor in London, uh, did a systematic study to try and understand what was the cause of the spread of disease. And what Dr. Snow did was he did a survey of the people that died from cholera, and he asked uh, those people that knew them, where did they live, where did they work, uh, where did they get their food, where did they go to church, uh, where did they get their water, and just a long list of questions. And in the process of this study, what Dr. Snell realized is the one thing that all the victims had in common was they got their water from the same well, a public well. At this point in time, there was a community well in the center of, uh, of the town area in the Soho district of London, and the people would come and they would pump the handle on the well and they would get their water. And the one thing that all the victims had in common was they'd gotten their drinking water from this same source. So famously, uh, Dr. Snow went down and he took the handle off that pump. And that helped to curb the spread of the epidemic of cholera in London at that time. It turned out that the, uh, the cause was identified as a, a diaper, an infant diaper that had been disposed in a cesspool. This is a, a cement block tank below ground and the cesspool leaked, and it leaked water into the ground, then that water ended up in the wells, and so people would drink the water, they would get sick, and then um, that cycle would continue. Now, as uh, Dr. Snow studied the deaths over time, what began to appear is a trend. Uh, a few cholera deaths, and then those numbers picked up, and so you can see a graph of uh, time on the x-axis and cholera deaths on the y-axis, you see a slow increase and then all of a sudden a rapid increase. And then as the intervention happened, as uh, the handle was removed from the pump, as people began to remove away from that area, uh, the number of deaths began to drop off. And this is a classical diagram that's used in public health to understand the occurrence and, and the decline of an, of an epidemic. The interesting thing about this is, um, in studying the people that died of the cholera, some of the people didn't necessarily live right in that area. There was one person that lived uh, several kilometers away. Well, it turned out this person used to live in that area of London, and they really liked the water from that well, and so they would periodically get water from that well and take it to their home. And so, unfortunately, uh, this person was impacted by the cholera, even though they no longer lived in that area. So Dr. Snow, uh, John Snow, has become known as the father of epidemiology. Epidemiology is the study, systematic study of disease and how disease spreads. And his systematic study was the first example of this type of a approach to studying public health. He's also known as the father of water treatment because he was the first to recognize that disease, cholera in this case, could be spread through the water. And so all of a sudden the importance of treating the water and making the water safe uh, became paramount. And so we know him in these two respects. If you visit London, as I did on my first trip to London, one of the places I most wanted to go in London was to the Broad Street Well and to see where this famous episode occurred. And you can go there today and there's a, a pump uh, in tribute to this great discovery. And there's actually no handle on the pump. Uh, ceremonially, the handle is removed from that pump to demonstrate what Dr. Snow did back in the 1850s. And you can also go uh, right next to this, and there's a plaque on the side of the John Snow Pub. 
So you can do as I did, go in and have a, a brew in honor of Jon Snow and the major discovery that he made. So cholera is a, a major source of disease. It's something that we don't know so much in the U.S. Uh, anymore uh, or in London uh, as we did in former times. There's two movies that help to depict the, the devastating effect of cholera. Uh, one movie is Horseman on the Roof, and this movie depicts uh, France in the middle 1800s. And it's a, it's a love story of sorts, but it's uh, set in the backdrop of a major cholera epidemic in France, showing that France at that time was very uh, vulnerable to the spread of cholera. And the second movie, uh, The Painted Veil, uh, depicts China in the 1900s and again shows um, the devastating effects of cholera and also shows in that movie the realization that the cholera was being spread through the water. So these are two popular movies that you could watch uh, to see a, a de depiction of cholera in former times. But let's move forward now to Chicago in the late 1800s. Chicago, unlike Michigan, um, was impacted not by cholera in this case, but by typhoid fever. The people got their drinking water from Lake Michigan, but as it turned out, their waste also would flow into Lake Michigan. And so as the people would get sick, and that would go into Lake Michigan, that waste, and then people would bring their water from the lake, and they would, um, the cycle would continue. And so we see again a graph of uh, typhoid deaths, uh, deaths due to typhoid fever versus time in Chicago. And we see these numbers were very high in the late 1800s. Interestingly, there were several things the city of Chicago did to try and help respond to the situation. One thing they did was they moved the water intake two miles out into Lake Michigan. So rather than getting the drinking water right from the shores of Lake Michigan where the waste was going into, they were now getting the water from two miles um, out away from the shore. And that helped to reduce the number of deaths due to typhoid fever. They also uh, reversed the flow of the uh, the sewage canal. They actually raised the city of Chicago so that the canal would flow in the opposite direction. And that also reduced the number of deaths due to typhoid fever. There were incidents, though, uh, that caused an increase in the number of deaths due to typhoid fever. A famous example is the Great Chicago Fire. You may remember the story of Miss O'Leary's cow knocked over the lantern and uh, the Great Chicago Fire happened. And as the firefighters were trying to put out these fires, all the water they were putting on the buildings washed waste into Lake Michigan. And so there was an increase in the number of deaths due to typhoid fever. So this was an example of something that actually caused an increase in the number of deaths. In Chicago, one of the few buildings that survived that great Chicago fire is the water tower, the Chicago water tower. And so if you're there, you can, as I did, go to visit this landmark and you can see uh, one of the only buildings that survived the Great Chicago Fire. So it really shows the resilience of the city of Chicago to be able to uh, come back after that devastating fire. But it also points to the importance that safe water had to the health and the vitality and the growth of the city of Chicago. And it's now a historic landmark um, as well as uh, an icon for the city of Chicago. So now we've looked at cholera in London in the mid-1800s. We've looked at typhoid fever in Chicago in the late 1800s. Now let's fast forward to Milwaukee in 1993. So we learned about the spread of disease, cholera, typhoid fever, and had implemented water treatment. And that had a great improvement in health and great reductions in the number of deaths. But now we find ourselves in 1993 in Milwaukee and there, Milwaukee, uh, 600,000 people in Milwaukee at this time, again on Lake Michigan uh, as Chicago, and there was an outbreak of cryptosporidium, uh, yet another pathogen that causes a disease and deaths, and there were 400,000 people in 1993 that reported getting sick from this outbreak, and there were on the order of 50 to 70 people that died. Um, and many, many thousands of people hospitalized. This was a time before we really understood cryptosporidium. It was a more recent uh, pathogen of concern. And it was a time when we learned several things happened all at the same time to lead to these deaths. The, there was record 
rainfall in the lake was uh, turbid, was murky because of all this runoff and all this erosion. And so that happened. And then the water treatment plant had just changed the chemical that they were using to treat the water. Uh, up to this time, chlorine was the most common way of disinfecting the water, making it safe to drink. But since this time, we've realized that chlorine is not as effective with cryptosporidium as it is with cholera and typhoid fever. And so this has led to ozone and UV um, light as other ways of disinfecting the water. But here we see, in more recent times, uh, the outbreak of disease. And we see that it only takes a couple things uh, going wrong all at the same time. And we see this when there's a, a, national, a natural catastrophe, a tornado or a flood and the system is compromised, all of a sudden the water is unsafe. And so we find ourselves back in the 1800s, if you will, in those times, or we find ourselves in the same situation as people in developing countries today, who, where you still have two million deaths a year, uh, mainly children dying because of uh, these waterborne diseases. So we find that we've seen through these three case studies London in the mid-1800s, Chicago in the late 1800s, Milwaukee in 1993, the importance of water and health and the importance of preventing wastewater sanitation from harming our water supply and causing the spread of disease. And this is most, one of the most important things we do. The British uh, Medical Society did a study to evaluate what medical advance has saved more lives than any other medical advance in the last 150 years. And the thing that came out number one in that study was water and sanitation, critical to public health that we know the, uh, today. And just one final comment, one of my hobbies is reading Abraham Lincoln biographies. And Abraham Lincoln had four sons. Only one of those four sons lived to adulthood. Uh, one died in Springfield, Missouri before Lincoln went to become president. One died while he was in the White House of typhoid fever in Washington, D.C. And then one died actually after Lincoln was assassinated of tuberculosis. Only one of his four sons lived to adulthood. You see, you could say that we were a developing country, the United States, at this time period. But we've had the good fortune of medical advances and we have the resources, uh, the economy to support good public health. And that makes us think of those people in developing countries who are less fortunate. And we need to help them to come to where we are today. So hopefully you have a better understanding uh, through this lecture of the importance, the critical importance of water and health and the role that it plays in the health that we enjoy today.